I'm guiding my friend Christine Lucan on a nature trail that weaves through a beautiful Jerusalem pine forest. We're standing under a canopy of blue autumn skies, listening to the songs of the little birds. We've been standing there for half an hour, gagged, bound, barefoot, being held hostage by two Palestinian men who have their machetes at our throats. Half an hour of terror, shock, confusion, emotional inertia that leads to the delusion of reprieve that we will be released or rescued. Half an hour of debilitating uncertainty and half an hour of unadulterated fear. I love irony. Somebody asked me if I was scared to do a TED talk. Machete, TED talk, close call. <laughs> Finally, one of the men pushes me on my knees and shoves my head forward to the ground. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this light. And it's the sun glinting off his machete. And I prepare myself <coughs> to be beheaded. I wasn't. The forest rings out with this cosmic symphony. They scream, Allah Akbar. My Christian friend Christine cries, Jesus help me. And I hear my own pathetic and helpless whimper of Shema Israel. He stabs me in the back so hard that I fall to the ground and now I'm laying on my side and he's leaning on my thigh and he is repeatedly plunging his machete into me. And he's doing it with such force that I can hear my bones crunch and as he tugs out that serrated blade, I hear my flesh rip. And in a total state of shock, I plead heaven, give me one more chance, let me live. And the only chance I have is to play dead. And I know people die with their eyes open, so I just focused on the side ahead of me and took those blows. And the only thing that I saw was two meters away, an innocent woman valiantly struggling with her assailant, in vain. I watched her hack to death in front of my eyes. They leave. My ear is pressed to the forest ground and I become aware of these vibrations which crescendo into the thuds of footsteps and they're coming back. And one of them turns me over so now I'm looking up at those blue skies and the setting sun which is obscured by a silhouette of a man's hand clutching a knife. And I watch him plunge it into my chest, and I didn't move, flinch, or blink, and it missed my heart by four millimeters. Believing I'm dead, they leave. At that point, I didn't know if I was dead or alive, or in heaven or hell. I knew I wasn't in hell, because uh, I couldn't hear any country music. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have one last commission in life, and that is to try and get up and die nearer to where I parked the car so the police could find my body. And after this enormous struggle, I managed to stand, and step by step, one foot in front of the other, very slowly I begin to walk. And nothing hurt at this point, thank God, only the shoelaces which were cutting into my wrists, and the thorns which were piercing the bare soles of my feet. And my clothes, they're drenched and they're soggy with blood and sweat and they're sticking to my flesh. And my face is caked with dirt and streaked with perspiration. And my nose is clogged with dry blood and, and gravel and behind the mask, the gag, I'm trying to use my tongue, which feels like this straw mat, to shift aside chunks of vomit so I don't retch and choke to death. And with each step as I walk, I listen to the sounds of the forest and I hear twigs snap under my feet. I hear birds twittering, crickets chirping, flies buzzing, bees humming, and I hear the wind rustle through the trees. And as I'm walking, I also hear music. 
and I hear D flat major 9, G flat minor. And in order not to think about my friend and to focus on my grave, I start to compose an arrangement in my mind of somewhere over the rainbow. And as I'm thinking about those lyrics, and I'm thinking about those chords, I'm overwhelmed with grief and loss. Never again will I see the people I love. Never again will I feel their embrace. Never again will I hear the howl of the desert wind or the crash of the Mediterranean Sea. And never again will I even hear children laughing. And I also hear bubbling and gurgling, and it's my lungs filling up with water and blood. And I'm acutely aware that the next breath and the next step could be my last. Surprisingly, I don't find uh, my grave. I find help. I had six snapped ribs, some of them poking out of my back. I had 30 additional fractures in my rib cage, some of which the bones had splintered and were puncturing my lungs. I sustained a crushed sternum, a broken shoulder blade, a dislocated shoulder, and 13 machete wounds in my lungs and diaphragm. And in that state, bound, gagged, barefoot, I walked step by step, uphill, for over a mile. I rushed to Jerusalem Hospital, Adassa and Karam, and uh, it's quite striking really, but as I'm in that trauma emergency unit, the sentence that I remember that stuck out, stood out, was from one doctor to another who said, Muhammad, tell me sakin. <laughs> Muhammad, pass me the scalpel, the knife. It was an Arab Israeli surgeon who saved my life. Christine's body is located the next morning and the police order a media blackout so they can do their work. Now, six weeks after the attack, I begin uh, the lifelong process of trauma therapy. And as I'm coming out of the session that day, I uh, get into the taxi and in the back seat is a very large lady. So I'm kind of squeezed up against the door and she has short, uh, no sleeves and a low cut vest. And we're like driving along and the driver puts the radio on. And suddenly I hear my own name and it's a press conference. And it's the Jerusalem policeman, the high commissioner, and he's talking about me. And he says, Israeli tour guide, because of her, because of Kay Wilson's courage and presence of mind, she managed to stab one of her assailants with a small penknife. And the blood on her knife helped us catch the murderers and also an extensive terror cell. And not only that, uh, the murderers also confessed to Butrin Neta Blatsorek another Israeli lady, 10 months previously. So this hullabaloo breaks out in the taxi. I mean, the driver's slapping the steering wheel. He says, oh, that's amazing. And this, this large lady is saying, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, praise the Lord, thank God. And I couldn't resist it. And I, I squeaked because I couldn't speak at the time. I said, it's me. And she maneuvers herself sideways to me and I see her lovely round face and those beautiful brown eyes welling with tears and her chin is quivering and before I know it, I'm like in her embrace and my face is wedged inside her cleavage <laughs> and, and my forehead is covered with sweat, that isn't even mine. So that journey was memorable for more than one reason. Nine months after the murder, uh, I have to appear in court. There was no forensic doubt. There was the blood on my knife and there was uh, their own confession and my testimony. But like any other democracy, Israel affords everybody a fair trial. And when I was sitting in that courtroom, it occurred to me what a uh, microcosm it is of my country. First of all, the room is so small. So small, just like Israel. And I was sitting four or five meters opposite from the people who tried to murder me. Second, like Israel, it was all a little bit informal. And uh, I remember looking at the state attorney, you know, with his black ironed legal robe. And underneath, I see a pair of Levi's and Nike sneakers, you know. <laughs> yeah, just like everything else in Israel, don't come naked. And thirdly, uh, it reflected Israel because it was a a uh, microcosm of conflict, but also compassion. 
And from all over the country, people came. People I didn't know. Jewish people, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Druze. They came to show their support for myself and Christine and Netta's family. And they also came to show their abhorrence at such a heinous crime. And as those proceedings were taking place, I'm flooded with these intense emotions. Firstly, bewilderment. How can, how can two men who were once little boys, hack at innocent, defenseless women without blinking an eye and smoking a cigarette afterwards? And as they were smirking and giggling at me, I felt a victim of my own rage, which I had to contain. And then there was the survivor's guilt, which I was suffering from terribly at that time. And after the trial finished, a man approaches me and he says, how are you? I thought, never miss an opportunity. So I said, I've lost my friend. I've lost my health. I've lost my home. I've lost the dignity to provide for myself. I've lost my anonymity. I've lost the sense of ever being understood by another human being. I've lost sleep, weight, routine, even the ability to answer how I am. And being a random and senseless target of terrorism, I've lost my humanity. Oh, and I've lost my innocence. And he looks at me and he says, wow. So what else is new? <laughs> now, it wasn't really, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? I understood in that man's response he was charging me with a commission to choose life. He was telling me, you know what? There's more to you than being stabbed. You don't have to live your life in perpetual victimhood. But given what I've seen and experienced, how can I absorb something so evil into my soul without it consuming me or defining me? Because I do not forgive and I cannot forget but I will not and cannot afford to live the rest of my life in hatred or fear. And paradoxically, to liberate myself from that darkness, I have to go back to that long, lonely mile walk through the forest. And I have to remember the sound of my lungs filling with blood, the sound of death. And I have to remember that then, as now, I am aware that each step, each breath could be my last. I have to recall the things I was thinking about as I was dying, the things I was grieving that I'd never see again because it's those things in life which are important. And as I'm trudging through that valley of shadow of death, I have to choose to look to the light and not just see the shadow. And that means I'm thankful for that setting sun and I don't just have to see that silhouette of the machete. It means that I choose to listen out for the songs of the birds and not just hear the whimper of my friends. And I choose to smell those beautiful, fragrant Jerusalem pines and not just smell the vomit behind my gag. And it's those step-by-step, -step, momentary choices that have enabled me a survivor of Arab terrorism, to reach out to an Arab teenager who was undergoing death threats from members of his own community and at the risk of my own life, hide him in my house. It's enabled me, a survivor of Islamist terrorism, to travel in Egypt and hang out with a wonderful Muslim friend. And it's enabled me, a survivor of Palestinian terrorism, to reach out to a Palestinian friend and via social media, help him find people, human resources to aid him to kickstart a small business. Because like me, my Palestinian friend knows that to be shackled in individual or collective victimhood is not helpful, kind, true or moral. So I've learned that life is step by step living in the moment. It's engaging in senseless and random acts of kindness. Life is calling somebody up just to hear their voice. It's rushing outside when it starts to rain. It's shaking the sand from my shoes. It's scraping the mud from my boots. Life is the sound of a cork popping out of a 2010 Golan Heights bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. Life is making somebody giggle. 
Life is accepting the past, but embracing the now. It's acknowledging the future, but living in the present. It's knowing that people are always more precious than time. Life is the freedom I experience when I look to heaven and I say, I don't have to understand why. It's the relief I sense when I can let go because I don't always have to be right. And life is living my life with the acute awareness and the profound knowledge that every single breath and every single step is nothing less than a miracle. Thank you.